let's okay. People call you TR Foley. It's Tim Foley. What's what's the R for? I mean, R is for Ryan. TR Foley is just you know when I came out of journalism school in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, it was like you know, it's Tim Foley catchers and pitchers, and everyone was talking about Google ability. So just yeah, just have TR Foley as sort of a, a you know a way to have a, a, a pin name, I suppose. But you know, it's just Tim. My parents call me Timothy. My friends at home call me T. Most of my friends from college call me Foley. So it's a variety of names. I think like all of us, right? Yeah. So it's a pen name, essentially. Tr. It's your your initials. Yeah, no, your... no one really calls me Tr. No. Okay. So I yeah, I've only ever called you like even when I've like yelled <laughs> at you in like Vegas. It's always been yeah. Tim. Yeah, that's fun. But I got to be careful yelling at you in person, man. You'll kick my ass. I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, no. not really. You're you're kind of civilized. You know, I actually today I had to almost pull my wife off with some people. They were walking through this. We had we're in this. This garden, this outdoor garden, it's like a huge park. Uh, it's one of the one things that they left open in Virginia during this um, during the state lockdown because it's easy to keep distance and all that kind of thing. Well, these two older women came bombing around a corner, power walking, and they like our daughter was like playing the mulch, and we were kind of standing to the side. And I guess because they felt like they had to split us, they weren't keeping six feet, and they made this unholy like mess about it, grunting and like. Call, this is the 60 something year old woman. She turned around. She called me and my wife idiots because we weren't giving her six feet. We're like, you just ran down the middle of a street, like at a, a middle of a path at a random time. Like, how are we supposed to know that you're going to come here and that you can't wait two seconds for us all to kind of. Anyway, it's just, I think people are so much on, or kind of on edge right now. So here's the other thing. I, I'll, okay, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'll take that. Over how my parents are treating it. I'll take that. I'm going to be honest with you. Because my parents, I told you, my mom got a courtesy ride back from the dealership to get her car fixed. And I'm like, I'm FaceTiming with my dad. This is like two days ago. And she gets out of a random SUV. And obviously, there's it's not self-driven. And it's like a person drove her there. And I'm like, they, they just don't get it. They literally just don't get it at all. So I'll take that, that over. And then we got people on the path. Because we go hiking every day around here. We live out in Geauga County in Ohio. And we got like a lot of nice, you know, hiking paths. And the people with their dogs, we step, I pull my kids off the side, right? Yeah. And people will let their dog get close to us. And they're like, oh, he won't bite. And I'm like, no, we're not petting dogs. You don't understand. That's exactly. That's what we're doing today. That thing could be a carrier. That, and it's just like, yeah. maybe I'm paranoid, but at the same time. So let's just get into that. If I, Maybe I'm paranoid, but maybe I'm not. You actually tested positive, and you're on the, the road to recovery from COVID-19, yeah. right? No, I think, I think you know, to start this off, like, I've obviously done a few interviews, but, like, one of the things that, you know, I we went out to Kazakhstan in September, and a good friend of mine, a teammate who's, like, uh, I don't know, he's probably he's a lot older than me, like, five or six years, he's a really famous videographer. He tested positive as well, and he and we just figured it out through a mutual friend, um, and we called each other, and I was like, oh, no shit. And he has the same, you know, he had a lot of the same symptoms and stuff. Obviously, this wasn't from Kazakhstan, but it's interesting because being from New York, I must know now like four or five people, you know, that have all been sick and tested positive and all that kind of stuff. So I think it is, it's really just a function of, I think, the city and, and being there. But yeah, I, I, uh, I tested positive on the 22nd, but I, I started feeling sick maybe like the 13th, um, and I lost my sense of smell and taste on the 16th, about, so... Did you, it was it was pretty quick. I mean, all over. I mean, who knows how long I had it before that? But yeah. did you know right away, or did you suspect right away, due to like just how it, it kind of like the trend it was going at in New York City, and and obviously the the New York City thing is it's it's the epicenter of it in the United States of America. Obviously, it's the most densely populated area in the United States of America. If you look at like Los Angeles County and Orange County, that's spread out over a big, huge area. Yeah, the five boroughs are not like that. No, we're stacked on top of each other, and also we accept a lot of international travelers. It's a very international city, so you know I think you know after even even after the travel ban was put in against China in mid January, forty thousand Chinese came to America after that, and most of them are coming to New York. So like you know if you do talk about direct transmission like that as opposed to community spread that gets that is what we're obviously experiencing now, um, that was happening. Also, travelers from Italy, travelers from other hotspots, it's just. New York is one of those like top four destinations in the world that you just go to and that people travel to. So yeah, and then once you're there, you're in the subways, you're in the shared cars, you're in. Um, I have an apartment building of 360 units, and it's like 
we're all in there together and the, and the elevator is touching the same things. I'm at a WeWork. So there's, yeah, there is so much human contact that, of course, I think that's been a big propellant for the spread. And, and certainly it's hard for me, and even airports, it's hard for me to know where I got it. I'll never know. So. Okay. So when we look at like how China, like China, everybody lives in apartments. Nobody lives in a house. You live in an apartment. Which borough do you live in, by the way? I live in Manhattan. Yeah. So you live in Manhattan. What, what, what part of Manhattan? I live on 14th and 7th, so or 15th and 7th, so it's kind of like, uh, it's the very last street of uh, Chelsea, so it'd be like Lower Chelsea, but it's much more probably West Village, but yeah, Lower Chelsea, West Village. How far do you live from the water? Uh, Four avenues. So you're right there. I mean, you're... <laughs> Ten avenues the other way. So you're, yeah, you can get to the water really quick. Like where you guys have had the events, haven't you had the events in the Chelsea, Chelsea Pier before? They had the event at the South Street Seaport for Peter Streets. Yeah, they had it at uh, South Street Seaport um, at Pier 17 in 2018. Yeah, that was a really cool event. That was, was, really was that awesome. close to you? No. Eh, I mean, sure. Everything's <laughs> close there, right? If it, was, I mean, if it was a country road, it would be really close to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the city, it could feel like taking 45 minutes to get there just based on, you know, getting yourself around. So USA Wrestling, yeah, when they host that event, I, we don't, obviously the, 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 Future is so uncertain, but UWW actually did the last event. The last sporting event you could watch live was a UWW yeah. event in Ottawa. Right. Were you there for that? I was there for the championships the week before. Okay. Because that was the um, qualifier was the last event. Yeah, 7th and 8th. And then I was supposed to, I was meant to fly to Japan on the 12th and stay there till the 25th. And I was going to be there for um, uh, filming a documentary on Kaori Icho, four-time Olympic champion. Um, and then also doing some pickups and some small interviews with, you know, Fumita, uh, Higuchi, Yui Sasaki, all these other, obviously, uh, Rasaka Kawaii. Um, we we're going to do all that. Um, but that got canceled. But that's why I didn't stay for the, the qualifier. Um, and, uh, yeah, the qualifier was next week, and it was the last event. But I think, you know, one of the things that made it unique that week, a lot of people were canceling things, so was everybody was already there, I think, for the most part. I think with the exception maybe of a few athletes, most of the athletes um, and coaches had already been there during the championships or had already arrived to start working out. So looking forward, it became more dangerous, I think, to – more dangerous to – have everybody show back up again some at some later date and who knows what the situation is going to be like. So, um, and it, and it looks like, you know, nobody who competed at that tournament is tested positive. Obviously it's my bro tested positive apparently. Um, and he was, he was there during that time, but he didn't compete. He competed at the championship. So, you know, he could have picked it up in Cuba or in the airport or whatever. Does your daughter, you know, you said your daughter, she's 19 months. Um, you didn't get her tested, but do you think that she uh, contracted? I don't know. I, I, yeah, probably. I don't know. I mean, she obviously didn't have any symptoms. She was, she's, you know, healthy as, healthy as an ox. Um, but, yeah, I just, I don't know. I mean, like I was saying before to somebody, I was like, you know, we shared a bed for the first couple of days before we got a crib here. So we're sharing a bed. I'm, like, waking up with her hand in my mouth. Like, you know, it's pretty <laughs> intimate. You know, you know, it's like your father. And it's like you're just all over each other and, you know, giving her kisses like she's like just learning how to get kisses and stuff so it's like yeah i mean look it's fine if she did she did she didn't then so be it i mean i don't know what the future holds in terms of getting antibody testing or if it even matters if there's mutation of the virus or whatever but um but yeah she's healthy and that's all i can really ask for so my parents like you know my parents are in their 60s um you know we've been cohabitating now for about 15 to, uh, no for over three and a half weeks so you know uh, I'm obviously not contagious anymore, but we're still treating it the same. When I arrived, we treated it like I had it, which was a good thing. And then even now, we're basically like, now yeah, we, we haven't hugged in three and a half weeks. There's no reason to start now. You know? How's the setup? At least, they, at least they tell me it's about coronavirus. Maybe they just don't want to hug me. I'm not sure. <laughs> What's the setup with your parents' house? Um, you're, are, you're in the Chesapeake Bay area, right? Yeah, yeah. We're down, we're down in Chesapeake Bay down in Norfolk. It's a beach house. It's got a good number of rooms. Um, my wife and I work from my what was previously my dad's office is where we have our setups, and then um, we share a room. The baby has her own room, and my, like a, 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 a an extra room that they have, and so we're all spread out. We have our own bathrooms and that kind of thing, which I think is the big 
having bathrooms and washing hands, having your own bathrooms, having your own towels, and washing hands, not sharing drinks, not sharing utensils, that kind of thing, uh, which we haven't found to be very difficult at all. Um, I think the biggest concern for a while there was just that the baby would like, I was like, oh man, the baby's been kissing me, but then she's also been kissing someone else, or maybe the baby has it, maybe the baby's the one who's like passing this along to people. Um, but I think we've, we've kind of uh, gotten out of that, you know, gotten out of that window now. So, um, you know, I just kind of glove up and put the mask on and I go out to go get the food the last few days because um, I've been symptom free for, you know, 11 days or whatever. So. We don't know that it's going to circle back. We, we just don't know anything about it. It's novel. It's uh-huh. new, right? We don't know if it's going to circle back around to you. And, and if yeah. you get it again, right? Like, cause you can get yeah. the flu twice, right? You can get the flu, different, different strains, strains of it. Yeah. And it's obviously yeah. probably mutated, right? We, we just don't know anything about it. Cause I was talking to Dr. Mike Matten, um, mm-hmm. and he runs a bunch of ERs and I, his kids wrestle. They've been on world. He, I think you know who the Mattens are. They're from Ohio, but you know, he's obviously on the front line of this right now. And we just don't know very much about this right now. Right. What is it? Sorry, we don't know. Uh, origination and obviously in terms of keeping, you know, in terms of American health policy, we're, you know, we're just trying to like mitigate disaster. We're not, not even getting to the point of like contact tracing and controlling these small groups of individuals who may, where these little clusters happen. So I just think we're like, yeah, we're such, a, such a period of incredible uncertainty right now. I think that, you know, in terms of the concern list, like antibody tests for myself or for someone else aren't just, aren't that high on the, I just don't think currently they're that high of a priority. Because it, it isn't. Um, and if you look like the movies, if you watch stuff like like I Am Legend, right? And you you were leaving New York City. That's a New York. That's a Manhattan actually setting. When you yeah. left, it obviously wasn't I Am Legend. When you left, did you guys just take a no, train down? down. What'd you do? I mean, yeah, you definitely was slowing down. I mean, you, you could get a sense. You know, I think we, my wife and I, um, we were fortunate enough to have childcare. It's, we both work and I travel so much. So we have a, a nanny and, you know, we went after work because I was like, I think I'm going to leave tomorrow. Maybe. I don't know. Oh, well, let's just, let's go have a drink. And we're like, let's try to go to bar. This car, bar Pasolino. It's a uh, really tough, not tough to get into, but it's just typically packed. And uh, I was like, oh, wow, there's not that many people out today. And I think that's been the, the trend for some time now, even, you know, starting three weeks ago. But I, I know I'm speaking to some of my videographers who are actually based in New York too. They were telling me they've been like getting out and going around the city a little bit and getting these like epic shots of like, you know, the clean streets, kind of like what you saw in I Am Legend minus the, uh, you know, the elk running down the middle of the street. It wasn't madness though. Like it obviously wasn't like these military quarantines or like gates no. up. When you guys left, did you and her just take the train down and switch trains? What'd you do? No, we, uh, I, there was a car dealership down the street from, uh, Hertz down the street from me. And so I just got a one way rental, which is incredibly uh, uneconomical. I would, it was horribly expensive, but <laughs> we went to, um, you know, we just drove through the night. She decided it was a party. And so she stayed awake the whole time. She, I don't know why. I mean, she always is like seven fifteen. She's like asleep. She wakes up at seven. She's always been a great sleeper. Three hour nap sometimes. But she, um, for some reason, she got in the car and she was like, "This is cool. Like, let's let's stay up." And then she fell asleep. Like, finally, I got pulled over. No, she fell asleep at ten forty-five. Like, I got pulled over at eleven fifteen in somewhere in Maryland in a speed trap. The woman came up to me and she's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "I'm going to Virginia from New York, just trying to get away from the you know the situation." And then I'm whispering because the baby is in the back, you know. And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." So don't worry about it. Sorry about that. Yeah, give me the ticket. I gotta get. I gotta go. And she came back and said, "Just a warning. Just a warning." And I was like, "Oh, this is great." But then the baby woke up like on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, which is like a twenty-six mile a twenty-six mile bridge. We've gotten to traffic, and so there was like forty minutes left. She woke up and she was like having her having a moment, you know, for forty-five minutes, where she made me hold her hand as I was driving the whole time. It was like, oh man, I was so tired, so tired. But yeah, that's what we did. We just kind of escaped that way. And that's the what that that's bridges and tunnels and bridges and t- it's it's it varies where you're at on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, so right? Crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's a hardy it's a hardy piece of construction, but yeah, there's a couple of tunnels and two tunnels, and uh, it's not like a ton of mileage for the tunnels, but they have most of it's they just do that obviously for the ship passing. But you can see from the window here, you can see all the ships going through. When the Comfort went up to um, when the Comfort went up to New York, it left from here, so we could see it leave. And then go to New York, the medical ship that was sent up by the Navy. 
So, um, you know, all that's crazy, but you and her were able to drive in and you were able to just drop the car off at Hertz. The and, then, car, yeah. and then how'd you get from Hertz to mom and dad's house? Well, I just dropped it off the next day. So I had 24 hour rental. So they just, they followed me to the airport, dropped it off, came back, washed up their car. Cause I was in it. Yeah. <laughs> it's been so wild. The whole thing's just been crazy. It's with, you know, it's interesting. Like I think, and I'm sure you're going through this as well. It's, it's such a new normal now, you know, it's already becoming a new normal and it's, it's strange. It's, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, it's going to be, it's a slow moving, the lack of a better term in terms of cultural impact is a slow moving 9-11 in the sense that it's going to have ripple effects for decades and decades. And there are going to be some who are going to be extremely small things. Like, can you imagine shaking a hand right now? Of course not. You're not going to go and shake someone's hand. You're not going to be hugging people for a while, you know, and it's a sad truth of it. But then you think of like the larger impact of like, what is this going to do for, you know, staying out of politics, but like, what is this going to do about public health? What are you entitled to as a citizen? Because maybe if I kept you, you know, maybe if we do a better job of keeping people who aren't employed on, you know, having them have medical options and maybe that keeps me safe, you know, in a situation like a pandemic. So there's going to be a lot of, you know, that, or like I was talking to my wife a couple days ago, I was like, we need to like take mushrooms or drop acid, you know, I don't know. And we need to figure out how to... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you do for these outcomes, but I was like, <laughs> we got to get like crazy, you know, introspective and whatever. And figure out how we're we gonna work doors in the future. Because like, if you're in a workplace and you reach and grab a door, it's like every time you're reaching and grabbing a door, you're thinking about it, right? So you either have to have this person wearing a glove, or maybe you just develop a new type of door. I mean, they have doors, obviously. That yeah, you can kick there. that kick door that a lot of the bathrooms have. There's a kick thing at the bottom. That's yeah, the new exactly no, that's right. dude, they gotta door. redo drawers completely. Doors are completely doors. redone. And that's not bad, except unless you're a door manufacturer and then you're like, innovation is great. People gotta buy more doors. Yeah. So there's all you know, there's there's these weird out there's so many things, there's so many things you haven't thought about that are gonna change, right? Seating on subways, seating on buses, personal yeah, just personal distance. It's, I mean, I don't think that you're gonna come out of spacing ever again. I think people are going to give each other no, no, this first. is the new, this is, no, you're right. So, That's hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, this is one of my partners, one of your guys' partners, right? There you go, there you <laughs> so, go, right? Hey, and, 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 you know, they partner with you got UWW, they, they're one of your partners, and if you look at, at a match, it's in the background, right? So, okay, right. door manufacturers with that kick thing. I mean, yeah. I talked to Guy, I talked to Guy, and I talked to Charlie Agazino, and you guys had them at, like, the U23s World Championships, and... They do a great job, but like they are even in distribution now. They had they have a they have a, a tablet, uh, a uh, disinfectant yeah. tablet that kills COVID nineteen, and they had to watch out for hoarding. You know what I mean? Really? Yeah. Well, yeah, man. Think about look at the toilet paper. Look at mm -hmm. the toilet paper thing, and it's like they're in a similar situation. It's something where it's it's a necessary product. You know, I saw Kyvin Gatson did a thing. He went, so he went and he did hand soap. He's like, "What were? Why is all the hand soap gone? What What have people been doing? Haven't they been washing their hands? What's going on?" And it's like, that's that's a product of hoarding. That's what that yeah. that's a, it's it's what it is. And it's like talking to Charlie and even just a little bit to Guy, dude. They're so busy they can't even like the product just moves. It moves, and, and you know, it's like door manufacturers when they start doing that kick door thing. That's what's it's literally what's going to happen. Yeah. And then but yeah, it's going to be all this innovation, like in small spaces, how do you do a door that isn't a pull door or push door? And if you did keep it the way it is, is it just like an extra motor on top? And where do you get the energy from that? So there's going to be all this sort of thing. And that's just such a minor aspect, right? That's a, just a very, very small part of this whole thing. Um, but it, it is interesting. And, you know, I think obviously there's going to be significant economic impact. I think that we're looking at September, October being like a time frame where we're going to probably have to go through this again. And what is that going to mean? Like when we go back into quarantine, is it going to be a bunch of people who are hoarding or are there going to be policies in place where we're going to be able to prevent that type of behavior? What's it going to do to rental prices, you know, uh, outside New York city for homes? People are going to be running away again because they don't want to be quarantined in a 900 square foot home. You know, my brother's a family, uh, family law attorney. He's like, this is, this is a gold rush. He's like, we're coming into a gold rush. He's like, people living in these homes together, there's going to be a lot more divorces coming up. There's domestic violence issues. So I think it's going to recalibrate the way we think of a lot about the world. And 
so a lot for the worse, I'm sure, and some for the better. You know, I look at the when you talk about that, China is now reporting. Well, I don't know how much we can trust China. I just got to be honest. When it's state run media, I don't even know how much we can trust our media, which is like independent, yeah. right? But China yeah. does, like, they skew their numbers. They they do all this crazy stuff. And in dealing with China, it's very difficult, right? Yeah. Whenever, but they're now reporting, and I just, you know, they're reporting a high number of divorces as they're coming oh, out really? of quarantine. Yeah, I saw that. But once again, Tim. Can we really believe a lot of the stuff you see on the internet? Like, I just say I heard that from you, right? Like, I've also heard stuff like, oh, they stopped out. Al- certain states have stopped alcohol sales, right? Like, and yeah. I like, I'll say these things to my wife. It's, it flashes across your screen and you give it five seconds of thought, right? Yeah. You don't know what's true and what's not true anymore. It's like, you got to yeah, go check I mean, five deep, putting right? On, putting on like my old journals and hat, like I, I tend to, just my personal experience, I tend to to stick to like, you know, the major three or four outlets like Reuters, AP, New York Times, Washington Post. And I stand I stay away from not sharing necessarily, but I stay away from taking a fact opinion. Like they have an opinion page. I try to separate that from from those obviously from the fact driven stories, you know. And it actually drives a lot of people on both sides of the aisle crazy because you'll see, you know, people who are a little bit more liberal, they'll be like why are they not, you know, saying the president's lying? Why aren't they using the word lie? And the New York Times is trying to, you know, they're trying their best, I think, to try to shoot the center or to get to the facts. But um, but you're right. I mean, it is hard when you think the media. In terms of Chinese media, yes, the state-run media is not giving you any close to any indication. And that's because the Communist Party is different than – the Communist Party is kind of – it is the Chinese government, but there's two separate things they should be. And then you have the people and everything else. But they were talking about the numbers in Wuhan and Hubei province being so low and underreported. And it makes complete sense in a system where if you report the true numbers, let's say that you're a, uh, the leader of a community in the Chinese government, in the Communist Party, if you you have, say, over a million people, and you're reporting that 19,000 people in your community died, and that guy's over there saying he only had 1,000, well, of course you're going to lie about the number that you had because you don't want to be the tallest weed, you know, when it comes, when it comes time to, to, you know, when it comes time to start putting blame in the communist government, you don't want to be the highest one. So of course those numbers are wildly, wildly underreported in deaths and, and everything. So, but that's, there's no good information coming out of China unless it's, you know, a foreign outlet. Yeah. Uh, another thing is like, I look at that whole Chernobyl thing, like the HBO did this Chernobyl, you know, and it's like, once again, you got to choose, pick and choose what you believe and you got to research. And it was th- their biggest thing is they wanted to deny, 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 deny lower numbers, minimalize whatever was happening. And you see that we're talking about a similar situation as far as that state run media, right? Yeah. This is state run media now. And it's like, they, they once again, you don't want to be the person who's who's giving out the high information or the alarming information to people. You know what I mean? Right. It's especially, um, I mean, that's, you know, that's, it's, 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 yeah. And it, I, as we were having this conversation, I just got a, I saw a New York, the only press alert that I have are, uh, what are they called? Push alerts, push notifications. Yeah, notifications. I have New York Times, and it says, uh, you know, coronavirus deaths in America are being underreported because unless the CDC is not taking it as a real number, unless the, person that died was actually tested for coronavirus. So, you know, we're seeing it here where there's the same discrepancies, you know. And, they, and of course, if you go too far in either direction, you you see just, like, insane conspiracy theories or, you know, whatever. Yeah, I'm so seeing a lot of that. Like, things. a lot, oh, and this then, isn't and real. And then you're like, actually, maybe they're on. And you're like, wait, no, they're not. We're not talking about how about yeah. when the people are like, this isn't real, this is man-made, it was created to control us, and I'm like, get your tinfoil hat off, man. Come yeah. on, I mean, like, you're nuts. <laughs> I know, it's hard. That's yeah, crazy, it's, it's right? Like, sometimes, like, if something is too big, you know, conspiracy theories, a lot of are a way for people to protect themselves from, like, a harsh reality, right? Like, Sandy Hook, there's a lot of deniers, and it, it's just, it's such a horrible thing to contemplate that you just think it didn't, you know, you have to come up with some other solution. Anyway. Yeah, like I, whenever you – was it you that was mad about Alex Jones having a platform? Alex yeah, Jones was on, the, the, was on the, the Rockfin thing, and I'm like, well, I think it was it was a bad look for Alex Jones. Who's an idiot and a piece of garbage anyway? Um, 
But once again, it's it's really hard to wash Alex Jones from everything. Would you agree with that? Hard? Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, I mean, get, getting rid of that guy <laughs> is hard phone, to do. But I mean, like, yeah, but I mean, I, you're getting into the bigger question of, like, what is the social media platform's responsibility to govern the people who provide the content in different countries that handle it in different ways. Of course, like Germany, for example, its laws apply to the platform. Where in America, obviously, we're very we're very cognizant of First Amendment rights and, and the ability to use that. But at the same time, Facebook isn't Facebook is an example, but um, Facebook isn't isn't the town hall. It is a service, and there's user agreements you can sign up for. So it does it does get interesting as to who can and can't be on certain platforms. Yeah. So they've deplatformed. If you look at Facebook, you look at Twitter. They've completely deplatformed Alex Jones. But did they still attempt to try and scrub him from everything on there? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't follow it. I'm not sure. But they, they deplatformed like he cannot post his own information on there. He cannot post content. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I, mean, I definitely remember him getting deplatformed. I mean, he's I mean he's been successfully sued also by the parents from Sandy Hook and and all those kind of things. I mean, it's just a, I mean, he's just a greedy loser and. It really doesn't, you know, I think sometimes it's as simple as just being, he's just not a good guy. It's just it, what he says is inflammatory for the purposes of selling, you know, protein powder. Did you see in one of the lawsuits, uh, actually it was him and his wife were getting divorced and they were splitting up custody of the kids. And actually his defense was in one of them, uh, oh, it's, it's, it's a gimmick basically. This is just a, a gimmick. Yeah. Did you know that? Did you know that that was one of his defenses? Yeah, I saw that. I, yeah, like someone said to me, like, could could you could you drive clicks like that? I'm like, no, I want to live with myself. I want to be able to look in the mirror. I'm not a oh, piece of garbage. Like, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, like, yeah, you might make some more money, but then you're not providing a better life for your family. If, you're, if they're if they're soaked in a life of you know fraud and 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 just yeah and alarmist and conspiracy theories, right? So what's the, what's the main back? If the main goal is just to make money. Yeah, and sure. You should do what you want to do, right? Or whatever. That's your moral code, and that's your moral code makes sense. But it's like you know, for you as a family guy, for you, you to drive clicks that way, I think it would be you know, it would run counterintuitive to what you're trying to actually achieve, which is a better life for your family and, and for your kids to grow up with, with respect for you and those types of basic um, basic functions. I think someone like that, he's so far off the rails too. You know what I mean? I think he's so far gone i don't think there's any coming back for him you know what i mean like no you know what i mean like even just the sandy hook was a hoax thing and how the family successfully sued him i think yeah. it, i think it really exposed his playbook even more and i mean if you ever watched the show it's insane he's just got like new it's nuts to watch it if you if you ever like just i know you'll lose your mind i can just sit there and be like okay this guy's nuts but like he's just got news uh Releases yeah. printed out and it like starting and he just like he goes up goes off. But um, yeah. let's talk about you and UWW and, and the future of UWW moving forward. Uh, Tr Tim, um, yeah. moving forward, what do you guys see? Obviously, the Olympics handed down the they've essentially moved it back twelve months, and Correct. everybody will keep their qualification who got it through their continentals, right? Right. Okay. What what else moving forward do you see? Uh, once obviously we don't know, but like where where do we go from here? And what do you guys do with now? You have to create a year of events. We don't even know if we can have those events, right? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think that the bureau met this Friday, um, had a conference call, and started you know creating the initial guidelines for what they want to follow. What is it that they want to achieve in the rest of 2020? What is necessary to achieve? What's beneficial to achieve? Um, when is the last qualifier? When's the last date that they want to make sure that they're having the continental qualifiers? The last chance qualifier, which is the top two from a you know combined tournament of nations who don't have Olympic licenses at that weight. And then of course we have the another ranking series event. Um, in addition to the grade school, not grade school for the different age group uh, world championships and the age group uh, continental championships. So I think what they're trying to decide is give us. You know, if, if X is the date that we want to run something, we have to understand in terms to be a good partner to the national federations, they have to have at least six weeks of uh, time to train. So the date, let's say that you could project out that worldwide people are going to be out of the situation or most people are going to be out of the situation come July 1. Let's say you could predict that. You would need to make, you couldn't have an event before August 15th because 
these athletes need to be able to get together, train back up to standard, and then qualify. So, you know, there is like this back game. Or if there's a qualification tournament that needs to happen internally inside of a country to qualify themselves to go to the continentals. And if you want to do a world championships, really what you have to do is you have to have the backstop before the continentals, get the continentals done, and then also get the uh, world championships done. And then if you add in the these kids are mostly in school, what time of year are you doing those things? Um, but right now, I think that the obviously the plan is to just make sure everybody gets qualified for the Olympics. I think that's the, the number one goal, is to ensure that the qualification process for the Olympic Games is completed in a time that also allows those athletes to come back down, you know, rest, recover, and then start peaking again for the Games. And I think second to that is creating ranking series tournament and also the age group world championships, continental championships, and stuff like that. And then I think over, you know, sort of overarching to all those things, it needs to be a system in which guidelines are established. How are we going to run tournaments? This isn't tennis. There's no natural social distancing. This is the, this, this sport has the most uh, to, to sort of own up to in terms of health. We already have medical checks and we're already sort of, maybe even the standard bearer when it comes to sports and ensuring safety among athletes um, in contact. But when you're talking about a, a, a virus like this, you know, how does that look? I, I mean, is there a testing? Is there temperature taking? You know, is it antibody test? Is that, is that even on the table given, you know, world health guidelines? So there's a lot of questions that need to be answered in terms of how you run those, run those tournaments as well. And n- now the testing obviously has gotten better, right? Um, I don't know what testing you had. You had the one where they they, they put the Q tip yeah. into your brain, I think. And yeah. um, five days though. But it was five days. Now they're saying they got like a a five minute or a two or three, right? Like the, it's yeah. it's it's technology, it's progress. It's we're America, and we'd like to think that we're on the front edge of everything. Yours was five days. It was five. Yeah. What did you do for five days? Like it's just like. Playing I mean, with your daughter every day, right? Like, what'd you do? Yeah, I mean, you just kind of keep your, you keep your distance. I mean, I guess I kind of just understood at that point, given the fact that I was suffering from, you know, I think it was called amnosia or whatever, that it was fairly obvious that I had it and just had to keep treating um, the situation like we were, that I did have it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think until there, there's not going to be a, a, a glut of tests for quite some time. And uh, yeah, we do hope that that, that testing, obviously, the turnaround that improves because we can, yeah, we can do more with that, right? We can definitely do more uh, with more testing, we even on the sport that. level, you know? And I think, I, I brought this up before, and it's not going to be dark and, doom, and gloomy, but if you look at ODU and how they obviously just dropped their program and they cited coronavirus concerns, which may or may not be, you know, partly crap, they... It is illustrating that there's going to be a larger issue that we face, which is there could be a reduction in the number of athletes that are, are coming out for wrestling come the spring and the summer, which is going to reduce the payrolls of you know local clubs and, re- and reduce the number of memberships for USA Wrestling. And any kind of decline like that is obviously going to be felt all the way up the food chain, right? And we just have to make sure that we're all aware that that's very likely going to happen, especially in a time of – this is regardless. This is if the, the economy whips off back into shape. But if it doesn't, it's even going to be worse, right? But we're going to take the biggest financial hit because, or even cultural hit, just because of the way that the sport is formed. We're so we're in such close contact, and there's such an immense fear now driven about um, uh, catching contagious disease. It's going to be really hard for wrestling to combat that. It's going to take a massive PR effort. It's going to take a vaccine. It's going to take. It's going to take a lot, and I'm just concerned that the next two years could be really, really tough for the sport unless – and I don't even know what we can or, or really do about it. I mean, there must be some innovations we can make, but you know, on the grassroots level, it's going to be very difficult to imagine a mom in Ohio saying, go to wrestling practice in July or August. Tim, you – That's a big – yeah. You grew up, um, did you grow up in Virginia? Yeah, I grew up in Northern Virginia. So, Ish. Nova? Ish. Ish? More, more, like, more like between Richmond and D.C. What high school did you go to? Went to Brook Point High School, next next to where Colonial Forge later came in. Okay. 
So you grew up doing freestyle. Now you work, or I'm sorry, you grew up doing folk style. You're a folk style all American. Yeah. And now you're in an organization that is freestyle Greco. They don't like, dude, if yeah. you've ever talked to any of these foreign guys, like we, I remember Joe Williamson and I went and covered the Russian national in like 2009. And we showed him, he showed him some video of like the Northeast duels. And they were laughing at the wrestling. It was like Brent Metcalf. And yeah. they were like good guys in the video. And, and they were like, what is this? Yeah. Right? They don't understand. Like the guys were, they're doing Granby rolls and flips. And they were like, why is the guy rolling across his back? It was funny to them. They were, ma they were like making fun of it. Yeah. And it was funny it was because, you know, and like, so now you're working for an organization that is, Opposite of what where you gained your success in wrestling, right? Because mm -hmm. you're an All-American at UVA. Did you win the Virginia State title? Mm -hmm. Never won Virginia. But you're an All-American. Yeah. I, I had a dream. I was just telling my wife on this walk. I was like, you know, last it, it doesn't leave you. Uh, I Last year of wrestling, I think it was like 2004 or so, 2005. I think I did a year for so. But 2004, I, I still, I woke up this morning like with the crushing anxiety because I had chosen not to prepare for in my dreams I'd chosen not to prepare for a match and I had lost. And it was like the end of my season, but I thought I had one more match. That was like the whole dream. And I still dream about missing weight. Never miss weight, but I still dream about like uh, that I would miss weight. You know what I mean? Like it's still kind of ingrained me in in terms of like freestyle versus like the, you know, folk style and that kind of stuff. Um it's just a different style, right? It's just a different style of wrestling. I spent a lot of time, you know, researching different styles, and they all have their. There are so many similarities across all of them. There's obviously, you know, technical differences, but um, the job doesn't necessarily require that I know all of the. I might do obviously know all the techniques and the people, but just mostly about distributing the information to our fans, our partners, and those types of things. What are your thoughts on? Do you see? how like steadfast Dana White is about having a UFC event. Like how, how crazy is that guy and how out of touch is he with this whole situation? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think he has a lot of pressure. No, I know that it's got to make money. I, I get that. I think it's, I think his fighters aren't getting paid and I think he feels some sort of compulsion to do that. I think also, is it Endeavor is the other owner, but you know, he's, he's been paying out coupons to people who invested he wants to keep those going. He doesn't want to sort of start taking big losses. And maybe he's overexposed in some ways or, or whatever. But also, whatever, if he is able to put a fight on, I mean, he knows that the upside's huge in terms of driving interest. Everyone's going to watch it. You, even watch, you, know, you, could, you could watch daytime soaps. That could be the only thing you watch. If, a sport, if any sporting event comes on, you're going to want to watch it. So Dana White is just, you know, he's just a – he's – Dana White, he's just going to promote as, as he can, right? Yeah. So. And I can tell you that um, if you and, – and listen. So one of my best friends is a WWE superstar. He's Dolph Ziggler. I wrestled with him in college. Nick Namath, he's Dolph yeah. Ziggler now. Did you yeah. see what they've done? Have you seen what the WWE has done with this? No, I heard something about They had some event last night maybe. They had WrestleMania. They, I think they split it in two days. Uh -huh. So they have – and if you've ever seen WrestleMania, is their Super Bowl. Yeah, they've done ninety thousand seat arenas and and Phil, they've okay. done the the Levi's Arena out in uh San Francisco, you know what oh, I mean? Okay. So like, but like the point is, you know, we get that the outcomes are predetermined. Everybody knows that they're taking real bumps, though. You know what I mean? Those guys are taking real bumps. He's had a lot of pretty bad injuries, but if you look at that, like, will we be able to go back to that? Will the NBA be able to go back to fanless games again? Like, I'm not saying you're the expert on this, but like, what is what does the future hold? Like, do we even know? Like, you guys, you guys have done it. You actually held an event, a fanless event. The guys weren't shaking hands. I mean, can we do that? Yeah, our guys weren't shaking hands. I don't know. Uh, fist bump. I saw more fist bumps. I saw fist bumps. I saw yeah, fist bumps. Crazy, I was watching it. Yeah. I was watching because um, Andy Hamilton gave me the code, and I watched on track. But a lot of guys were, they weren't smack, some of them weren't smacking hands. It, yeah, it was. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think that, you know, what you're talking about, obviously, is the two things, which is the competition itself and then the ability to, to have a gate. And I certainly think they're going to limp back into any gates if, once events do start. But I think that there was floated the idea that football was going to be played in August. And I would have a hard time. Believing that, 
only in the sense of, let me give you the worst case scenario. A hundred and some odd thousand people die before August 1st, right? That's sort of like the day it'll be between 80 and 200,000 people. Don't get me started on I me. Mean, we have our different opinions. Or maybe we don't, but whatever. I have my opinions. But let's just say that the country is mourning a loss of 100,000 of its own citizens, which is just horrific. If you have a football game, it can feel therapeutic, right? Like one of the things that after 9-11, I think, you know, football coming back was a big deal. But that was a quick strike thing. This is like a psychological battle that America is, is, is coming into. We've only been doing this now for two weeks, three weeks. We're going to be doing this for eight more weeks, right? And then if there's time off and if something doesn't flare up, I mean, can you imagine if, if, it, if it resurfaces in, in early September and Americans are at football games and spreading it to each other, what that would, I mean, I don't know. I just feel like the cost-benefit analysis maybe hasn't been thought through if that's, a, if that's a circumstance, you know? Assuming that the virus comes back out in September, October, like if it falls the seasonality uh, like that, then it's really difficult. It'd be hard for me to look at it and say, yeah, we shouldn't go for fucking but I'm just one guy, and I do think that that's what they're going to push for because there's so much money on the line. But it's the same. It's baseball. It's whatever. But I would encourage anybody who, who thinks about this to, to look into the, the study of the, the game in Lombardy, Italy, the soccer game in Lombardy, Italy. People ask a lot of times, like, why was Italy, Northern Italy so bad? And what was made obvious in this story was it was the biggest game in, I think, Lombardy's whatever their team – their history, and so a bunch of people came in from all over northern Italy. They watched the game and they went back. So many people got infected, and they just spread it out. And that's, by and large, it's, that was what that was what caused the spread. And I would hate to see that happen in America to, to watch football. So maybe or maybe not, there's going to be some amount of either social distancing at the games. They don't fill up the arena, and or maybe there's a certain circumstance in which they just play to an empty crowd, which would feel extremely weird. So my wife's from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Her high school is right across from uh, – Pioneer High School is right across from the big house, right? I don't know if you've ever been oh, to a right. game. There's 100-plus thousand people. Uh-huh. If everybody stands up, you're sitting on top of a quarter when you when you sit back down. I, yeah. just, I don't know how Michigan can do that. I don't know how the University of Michigan – I don't know how Ohio State and these – you know, these – dude, they have 100 – you know, uh, Penn State. They've got ninety to 110,000 people in their stadium. Like, I just don't know how you can do that. Like, I, I'm – dude, just football, I just – yeah, if it follows, like, a flu-type cycle, like, it, as far as timing, right? Because yeah. the flu comes back around uh, September, October, right? Because we're indoors more, and they're – right? I mean, then that kind of part of what does it, that goes outdoors, that, that's something, right? I'm not a doctor and an infectious disease person. <laughs> I'm not an epidemiologist or Yeah, yeah, I'm a social, yeah, I'm a social studies teacher and a part-time media guy. So you know what I mean? Like I don't I don't know how that works, but like like you're saying, I just, I just don't know how you can have football. I get that there's that billions on the line. I just don't know how. That includes college football, and that's and that's what scares me about NCAA wrestling is so it's like a business in a lot of ways, and I don't know because a lot of them are in debt, right? Like a lot of these schools run with debt; they are built on some amount of debt, and if kids aren't going to college, paying their bills because they can't afford their parents can't afford to go to school because they're in the bits are coming out of this a massive recession where people haven't worked. So now they're going to have a reduction in student fees. They're going to have a reduction in, in enrollment. They're going to have an obvious reduction. You're not going to put 105,000 people in a big house. To come. It's just not, like you said, it's just not possible. It's not a situation in which people would feel comfortable going. And they're going to have reduced gates. They're going to, you know, they could have reduced television rights or whatever the circumstances are going to be. It's not the football team that's going to get cut. In you know when 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 the board asks these athletic departments to to make tough decisions, we want to make sure that they're not reaching for the wrestling team. And it's 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 unclear if that's going to be the case. I'm not sure how it's going to be individual by individual case basis. But you already saw with ODU who, who had just wildly overspent on their football program to get them up to Division One status as like a as a savior type thing. The first thing they went for it was the first thing they went for. It's just such a it's such a common reaction, you know. So I I, I fear that that's going to happen again and again at programs that are middling or that you know where they're they're susceptible. 
I saw they kept rowing, which really makes sense around there culturally, um, where you guys are, right? How far are you from Norfolk right now? Uh, I'm in Norfolk. Well, you're in Norfolk, so you're right there. Um, I, yeah, from the university, um, yeah, I'm like 10 minutes away. But okay, I'm so like, you could I'm jog by it probably if you wanted to. What's that? You could run by it if you wanted to. You could run there, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah my brothers my brothers live, uh, you know, I have a bunch of brothers and a couple of them live in Norfolk, and yeah, they're a few blocks from ODU, wherever. So it's right there. They kept rowing, though, which culturally makes sense to the area you're in. Mm -hmm. Rowing makes sense. I don't, and, and I don't know how... I know rowing is probably more expensive, and I know that I looked at a breakdown. I think they've got a bunch of teams they kept with foreign athletes, right? But wrestling is just the easiest target, man. People don't understand it. They don't understand the rule set. They, it's barbaric to them. It's two dudes rolling around and sing. They just don't get it. So I think it's an easy target, but it's cheap to keep. That's the other thing. Like wrestling, what do you need? You need a mat and a room, right? Like. You don't need what you need with all these other sports. Like I don't know what rowing's cost is, right? I don't. I don't know that. I don't. I don't know what that is. But I, don't easy. I mean, I think that there's, there is just it's a habit. It's a habit to cut wrestling as well. I mean, it's just a it's something that you reach for and it's there. And one of the biggest reasons it's had a target on its back for so long is that there's no female equivalent that's been prevalent at the Division One level. And I think you know, especially with work that Sally Roberts is doing with Wrestle Like a Girl, you're seeing that growth happen. But I do wonder if it's, I mean, it's not too little too late because it is obviously having a positive impact. But when you when you sort of add it to the magic stew of pandemic, um, how is it going to, you know, can you, can you really have a school take on more athletes during this time? Maybe, 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 that, maybe that is the way forward. Maybe it is like an enrollment-based thing. And we can just get the schools that need it. You know, if it pumps enrollment, then it pumps money back into the school and they'll take it. I think that football, and, I, and I, I don't know if you agree with me or not, I just think football kills the Olympic sports, man. It's just like somebody said to me the other day, they're like, oh, well, they're, they, they, you, you have entire athletic women's departments who don't have 115 athletes in them. Yeah. You have 120, 115 athletes, 85, it's, it's Division One. 85 full rides. You can't yeah. make whole of women, whole women's athletic departments, right? And then if you look at the revenue, there's only a, a handful of women's uh, sports that actually make revenue, right? right? What's what's the cash cow? Football's the cash cow. Men's basketball's yeah. the cash cow. So it's like, like you're saying, it's so business based, and wrestling's just easy. And well, not I mean, having also, a women's equivalent ki has killed it. You're, I, I agree with you. We've capitalized it, right? It's become part of like the American economy to make money off of college sports. That's really not the purpose. The ultimate purpose was never to make money. It was to have students who go to the university have activities that they could do against other, you know, kids from different, you know, from different regions, from different schools. It's a diversity of opportunity, right? It's a diversity of experience that's brought onto campus. Like, my ability to know somebody on the, the women's rowing team or the field hockey team is a diversity. I'm getting a diverse look at experiences as well. And so having more opportunities at a school provides an educational experience, which is much fuller and much richer. And cutting programs and leaving just the football team is in no way benefiting the educational growth of your student body. You know, that's one sport, and it's, it's just not – the main function of an educational system is not to ensure that, that uh, the people who wear the same, the, the, the chosen colors of university, um, you know, maybe make a couple hundred thousand dollars, you know, at the end of the day uh, after expenses for your school. That shouldn't be the, that shouldn't be it. If you want to support it and you can support it, you just have to understand that it's not losing money. It's, it, there are, there is a return on investment. It's just not always dollars and cents. You're talking about like the manifest versus a latent function like the actual function of it was to promote diversity and to promote experiences to, yeah. uh, between the and then it became a business it, it, there's a latent function right like that's yeah the latent function of it has become let's make a bunch of money yeah and let's let's sell advertising let's like, yeah. you know let's get sponsorships like you know in these athletic departments uh, you know bless them there's a lot of people who are employed through them but like you know college campuses are have a lot of admin costs, and that that's the same with athletic departments. 
what is needed, what isn't needed needs to be revisited. I think a lot of times before you just go cutting opportunities from individuals and that includes the student body. And yeah. There's way too many fake made up jobs. That's my interpretation. It's just my opinion of what you just said. There's just so many fake made up jobs that are just not, they're just, it's so much fat that, and they're trimming the wrong. They're trimming, they're, they're trimming fat. That's not supposed to be trimmed. They're, they're, they're keeping five people in two and three hundred thousand dollar jobs when they can get rid of those five people and keep the program. I'm with you on that hundred percent. And my my life is completely based off of my whole experience in my life is because of my wife played volleyball at Kent State and I wrestled at Kent State. That's the whole yeah. that's how that's how this whole thing is even a thing. Sure. Sure. I don't know where you met your wife, but that's where I met why my wife. <laughs> No, yeah. Right? No, I didn't. Right? Yeah. I don't know what else to say about that. Like, I, I'm the poster child for that, for experiences and diversity. Like, you think I'm going to go track down an Ann Arbor liberal in a bar? I'm not going to do that. I, I, I met this. You make a good point, though. It's, it's, it also provides the student body a diverse opportunity, and it motivates certain individuals to perform better from their, in their own lives. They see someone performing well on, on the field. Like, one of the great thing about athletic feats is it can motivate us to do better in our jobs outside of it. Unfortunately, the way that it works, when someone does a really good job on a math problem, I very rarely get to see that innovation or I get to see the hard work. But you do get to see it in athletics. And that, that it does include more than the great catch on the football field. It includes great moments on the wrestling mat or on, you know, on the volleyball court. And it's really an opportunity that needs, to be, that needs to be retained at these schools. It needs to be an experience that the student body can interact with. Yeah, I mean, no question. And the, the first thing I always ask someone, if a kid's from Blacksburg and they end up at UVA, the first question, what's the first question I'm going to ask a kid who's from Blacksburg or Christiansburg and they go to UVA? What's the first question? Uh, why? I what? guess would be the first question. Yeah, why, why would you, you know what I mean? Why yeah. would you leave your home community where you've got this, yeah. you know, what do you think the first question to my wife was? Who's from Ann Arbor? Why are you yeah. here at Kent State? When yeah. a kid's from Columbus... And they go to Michigan or Michigan State. My first question is very easy. Like, yeah. why didn't you just go to Ohio State, right? Like, uh, yeah, it's yeah. like a no-brainer. Like, anyone who questions that, like, come on, dummy, right? Like, <laughs> right? Like, yours is pretty. Yours makes sense. How far are you from yeah. UVA? Yeah. How far are you from UVA when you were when you were born and raised in the school high school? How far uh, is that? Hour and a half. Hour and a half. That was a walk on. That was a walk on. What place did you take in the NCAA tournament, Tim? Eight. You took eight one seventy four. 65. 65. Was uh, Lenny your coach? Yeah, Lenny Bernstein. Yeah, and then was Steve an assistant then? No, Steve never was an assistant at UVA. He was a fifth year of my first year, and then he left and he became an assistant at Cornell. I stayed there for, I think, nine, ten years, maybe 11, and then he came down and he got the head coaching job. But he's actually been at UVA longer than Lenny was, which is interesting. Do they still wrestle in that little gym? They do some. They do some at the big arena. Um, I know that they still wrestled a little bit at Mim Gym, and they moved. They were like in a, a building that got torn down, their workout facility, and they moved it to Mim Gym as well. So I think they're all just in that the littler gym now. Yeah, because we wrestled a duel there in that little gym, and it was a crazy weekend. We drove down. We wrestled ODU. We wrestled UVA Tech, and somebody else because it was we we took a bus and we beat all of them. And I remember we wrestled in, we wrestled a try with the ODU and UVA, and it was our 600th program win, and I, I still have the paperweight, and the 600th win was ODU. And then the other oh, day, really? one of my buddies sent me a picture of it, and I was like... What year was that? Uh, I'd have to look. Oh, one maybe? Oh, two? I can look. I'll send you a picture of the, the paperweight, though. That yeah, win, yeah. that win over ODU was in UVA's gym. And I wrestled a kid from St. Ed's on UVA's team. Steve Mazzola? Yeah, that's who I wrestled. Yeah. 97? Yeah, 97. Oh, wait, 97? 197. 197. I was 197. St. Ed's? Yeah. Oh, no. You're thinking of, um, he wasn't from St. Ed's. He was from, uh, he was from, uh, uh, gosh, Canton. Did he go to Walsh, maybe? No, no, no. He's an Ohio guy. uh, I wrestled an Ohio guy. He's an Ohio kid. Yeah. Zach Friday. Yes, I wrestled that guy. Zach Friday. You beat him? I don't know. I was good. 500, so I wasn't super good. He was good. He was a he was a little butterball. Yeah, I wrestled that guy. He could 
freaking – he could move. He was so – he was very, very good. If I find the results, I'll, I'll shoot him to you. Um, yeah, shoot him to me. I wonder if I – I don't know if I wrestled in that match. What I'm about 0102? Sure oh, when did you graduate high school? 2000? No, 99. I was – I started – I went to the – I went to the NCAAs in uh, 2, 3, and 4. Okay. And all, the, all at 65? Uh, so you probably wrestled Nick Nama. No, I wrestled 57 until my final year. I was at 65. Because we wrestled you guys. Kent State, we wrestled you Yeah, we wrestled, you, we wrestled you guys a few times. Did you wrestle Mike before. Tolar? Who? Mike Tolar. He was an NCAA qualifier for us, 57. Yes. Yes. Oh, but man. like at the West Virginia Open or something. Isn't like it that. weird? It's so weird stuff that's not around anymore. <laughs> <laughs> not around anymore. Um. Well, listen, I know you got to get your daughter's uh, you got anything else for me? Any airing of grievances? Um, hey, you're a loud right. mouth idiot on Twitter. Shut up! Like, what do you got for me? Come on, let's let's no, let's, let's open it up. Want, I want everybody to. I mean, I, I was my biggest concern is I just want everybody. I think, like all of us, to just take it serious, take this thing more seriously than you ever could imagine. I mean, you know, I I was fine. You know, I was sick, but I will tell you. Losing your sense of smell and taste for any reason and not knowing at the time because I had it wasn't associated with it quite yet. It was a couple of days after I had lost my not knowing why was scarier than hell. So I'm sure, you know, when people are very, very sick and they're having from problems breathing, they can't catch their breath, it's gonna be terrifying. So nobody should go through that experience. Keep your distance, just wait it out, learn learn a new language, do a puzzle, whatever it is, just stay home and um that's the one thing, and I want everybody to stay safe. And then the other would just be when we talk about the things that we love, when we talk about wrestling and returning to a sense of normalcy, we need to be proactive as a community and come together and figure out ideas and ways for people in our community to feel safe when they return to the mats and when they start interacting with each other. And that's going to take, you know, it's going to take a lot of positive thought, but it's also going to take a lot of just cooperation, like working with our friends. If it's the people at Defense Soap, if it's, you know, maybe finding time to send you know, Mike Moore or Rich Bender and a polite email of here are some ideas and here's some people you should work with. Whatever the situation is, in any small way you can help, any big way you can help, but just thinking of ways to protect our sport from what is going to be a very difficult stretch of, of 18 months to 24 months when we can all have to get through this. And we all need to do our best to protect our sport and, be, and, and, and that's going to take a, a certain amount of cooperation. And then finally, I just hope that we all can enjoy you know, what wrestling we do get. I hope that we all can enjoy it together and and uh, have lively banter about outcomes and rankings and all that kind of stuff because those those days feel, you know, too far away already. And, you know, so when we do have that opportunity, I hope that it, uh, everybody can enjoy it. Awesome, Tim. Is your baby still asleep? I think so. Yeah. Better be. What's her name? Her name's Quinn. Quinn? Okay. And where'd yeah. you meet your wife? Uh, I met her in New York. Met her in, oh, in Manhattan. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And she works in finance, so. Yeah. She's a good person. I awesome. like her. Where's she from? She from? She's Chinese, but she's from um, she's from Pueblo, Colorado. Pueblo, Colorado. Yeah. That's like high dozer, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. She's like the only, I think they were the only Asian family in Pueblo for like 10 years. Are you serious? Um, yeah. No, seriously. Did she I go mean, to that college? Did she go to UC Pueblo? No, I think she, she went uh, northeast to Wellesley. Um, but yeah, she went. She actually goes to the same. She went to the same. She went to high school in Colorado Springs, the same place that uh, Bender's kids go. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And Bender's so. what is it? One of Bender's kids on. She's on the equine team at uh, Oklahoma State. Yeah, I think she was graduating, but yeah. I think she was on the, the wrestling is so on. crazy how it's all like you know so many people and you're you're so intermingled, man. It's just wild. Yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. It's just wild. Oh, hey, how was your run? By the way, you said you went on a run. Like, how much have you been recovered? Yesterday was my first. I I had done burpees when I was COVID, COVID, -y, and uh, it was just the worst mistake I've ever made. It was horrible. I couldn't catch my breath. Um, it was so bad. I can't even. Explain. I can't. Why would you do that? I was choking. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> I know, I know, but it's like that home wrestling mentality of like, Oh, I'm not sick. I can do this. It's so stupid. Um, it was horrible anyway, but then, um, 
I just went for like a light jog yesterday. Mm. Felt pretty good. How far? Little burn. But How far did you make it? Burn. Two and a half miles. You made two and a half miles. We were running ten yeah. minute miles at least. What's that? Ten minute miles. Ten miles an hour. Like what was oh, your gosh. pace? I don't. I hope it wasn't a ten minute mile, but it was certainly. I'm certainly not breaking any land speed records. No, it was me and my wife. We were doing like a you know like a friendly like nice little jog. Like okay. So I go out and I run and I try and keep it between nine thirty and like eleven. I'm a two. I'm a two hundred fifty pound man. So yeah, that's what I try and do. I think that's a great range. I mean, that's I I uh, I don't know. I'm just saying. I hope it was faster, only because of how tired it felt. Okay, got it. <laughs> well, it's good. I'm glad that you got out. But don't do any. I would wait on the hard the hard labor because I've been splitting wood and stuff like that too, and it's just like yeah, you got to dial it down, man. Right. So, all right, all right man. you good? Thanks for having me on. Awesome, Tim. I appreciate the time. Um, enjoy the uh, the water there. Enjoy your baby and keep recovering, man. I appreciate the time. Stick around a little bit here afterwards. Let me cut this video off, all right? All right.